In the previous lectures, we saw that Sarah and Hagar's relationship can be explained in light of Mesopotamian sources. The sources we discussed included the laws of Hammurabi, old Assyrian contracts, and a contract from the city of Nuzi. What they all have in common is that they are relatively old. They all date to the first half of the second millennium BCE. Some scholars believe this fact to be highly significant. These scholars have attempted to use the Mesopotamian sources not only to illustrate the biblical story, but also to prove its historicity. If the patriarchal stories find specific parallels in social customs of the second millennium BCE, this means that they are authentic. They reflect the reality of the time of the patriarchs, dated by many scholars to the second millennium BCE. The documents from Nuzi are especially important in this regard. The ancient Near Eastern scholar Cyrus Gordon argued that the legal texts found in the city of Nuzi exhibit many parallels to the patriarchal stories. For instance, in Genesis 15.3, Abraham declares that if God gave him no offspring, his steward would be his heir. Gordon found a similar practice in the Nuzi texts where slaves were adopted by childless couples. Gordon also identified parallels to the selling of the birthright to Jacob, to the legal relationship between Jacob and Laban, and so on. The Nuzi contract discussed in the previous lecture played a major role in Gordon's theory because it parallels Sarah's banishment of Hagar. Gordon and others in his wake took these parallels as proof of the historical authenticity of the patriarchal stories. Another prominent scholar who developed this theory was Ephraim Avigdor Spicer. In his influential commentary on Genesis, he discussed various parallels to the Nuzi texts. Gordon, Spicer, and their colleagues all addressed the broad problem of the dating of the patriarchal stories. We cannot discuss this issue at length here. You will find reading recommendations on our website. We will limit ourselves to the case of the barren woman who gives her husband a slave girl. Can this specific custom, documented in second millennium texts, prove that the patriarchal stories are early? The biblical scholar John Van Sitters, who opposed Gordon's view, has shown that the answer to this question is negative. Van Sitters identified parallels to the Sarah and Hagar case in legal texts from later periods. Here is an example from a 7th century BCE Neo-Assyrian marriage contract. If Tsebetu does not conceive and bear children, she should buy a slave girl in her stead and set her in her place, and so bring sons into existence. The sons will be her sons. If she loves the slave girl, she shall keep her. If she hates her, she shall sell her. This contract reflects all the basic components of the custom in question, a woman unable to bear children giving a slave girl to her husband, the children being considered her own. She is allowed to sell the slave girl at her will. We see again that the rules governing the mistress's obligations and her relationship with the slave and the offspring are different in each case. But the important point for the historical discussion is that this custom was not limited to the second millennium BCE. Van Sitters concluded that the patriarchal narratives were composed during the first millennium BCE. Yet, it seems that the very aspiration to draw historical conclusions from the legal sources is rather far-fetched. What we have are various texts from different periods that provide us with the social and legal context for understanding the Sarah Hagar relationship. These sources point to a custom known throughout the ancient Near East, according to which a wife unable to bear children could give a slave girl to her husband. All the details of the biblical story, from Sarah's bringing Hagar into her house to her decision to send her away, are well based in this ancient Near Eastern practice, which was common in different times and places. These insights are important in their own right. Yet when it comes to the historical question, 
we simply can't point to a specific time period when the custom under discussion was most prevalent. As in many other cases of comparative study, the legal materials we examined may teach us a great deal about the cultural background of the biblical story. They cannot serve, however, as a basis for dating the biblical material.